One is that um, on TV, uh, you rarely see drunkenness as a reason for crime. Drunk, drunk or high people, because it's such a boring plot point. This guy got drunk, that guy got drunk, one of them hit each other over the head with a bottle, you know, and that's it. And it's, it's a boring story. So alcohol is really downplayed, and so are drugs. Two, in real life, minorities are way overrepresented as victims of crime, but not on TV, because the advertisers want the white kids. But the thing that changed our parenting the most, or I think had the biggest impact, is that in real life, and I think you know this, um, the majority of crimes against children are committed by people they know, people who are in very close proximity to them. their family members, step-family, trusted friends. 90% of the crimes against them, that's who causes them. On TV, it's the opposite. On TV, it is always the hulking Serbian war criminal, or it is the clever, fiendish mastermind who is the only person on earth to go on Facebook and actually look at all your reunion pictures so assiduously that that's supposed to be like, oh, yeah, they were great. Oh, yeah, I looked at them all. Who would look at them all? Nobody ever edits their pictures on Facebook. It's so boring. But um, anyways, he couldn't be dissuaded by the 57 out-of-focus shots. He looked at 58, which has your child in the background, maybe with a t-shirt that says her nick, Kaylee, on it, and now he's thinking, oh, that tree is familiar, That's from a, that only grows in North Carolina, and he's Googling to figure out exactly where you live, and he's going to travel across the country from California to get your supremely adorable child, because that's the only child he could ever be interested in, this pedophile, and you start thinking that there's either creeps or masterminds out there the second you open the door. And on TV, they are always outside the door. So that's, I think, the media's role in making us much more afraid as parents. The second thing that changed is that we are living in really litigious times. And I don't think you guys are quite where we are, um, and I hope it doesn't happen. Um, but we are very aware of the legal consequences of everything and the possibility of being sued and that has infiltrated the way we think, so that we start thinking like lawyers before anything has happened. Um, this week, Fisher Price, you guys know Fisher Price, the big toy maker? Did you see this? They just recalled 10 million items. Because, and it was like things from high chairs to toys to, I don't know, I, you know, I've been like <laughs> on crazy time here. I didn't read the story quite as well as I should have. But um, the point is that over the last 10 years, um, 14 children have hurt themselves, um, seven of them, I think, needing stitches on these various items that Fisher Price sells. There was something protruding, like if you knocked yourself against the high chair, you could end up scraped, and some of the kids ended up needing a couple stitches. Nobody has died, but 14 children, 10 years, 10 million items now recalled as if they're dangerous. When when that becomes the threshold for how we think of as danger, when to me, that's living in wonderful times with items that you can totally trust, it, you know, because otherwise I could scrape myself on this and hey, hey, I could sue the, you know, thinking like an American, I could sue the Wheeler Center and then I'd have enough money to come back. Um, but, <laughs> but that's how you start thinking. If everything is considered unsafe, um, we start taking out everything out of childhood, and that's actually what's happened in the states. Um, park districts are afraid that parents will sue if a child falls off a swing, and so they're getting rid of swings. They're not rid getting rid of so many swings. They're making them, um, you know, very safe with a lot of um, mulch around them, but what they have gotten rid of are the merry-go-rounds and the teeter-totters. I always hated teeter-totters. I was always like, you know, this skinny little person who couldn't get down, you know, tormented by my friends um, who wouldn't let me down. But anyways, you'd want the opportunity, if your kid was a bully, to at least have a chance to get, you know, get their yayas out on a teeter-totter. They can't anymore. Now they have to go on the bus. So um, <laughs> I torment the children there. So there's no more teeter-totters. There's no more seesaws. And um, like at my son's school, at the end of the year, you got to remember, we're in New York. There's this exciting thing where the kids go out to this stuff called nature. Um, and they actually spend an overnight in this weird stuff with like trees and, and like bugs and the sky. And, um, and for a lot of children, it's a very exciting event because it's their first time out of the city and it's an overnight. But when the assistant principal was explaining it, 
um, to all the nervous parents in the auditorium, the hand shot up, you know, how far are they from a hospital? Oh, that's a pleasant thought. How far are they from that? You know, who's going to break their head open first? How far are they from the hospital? Um, will they have phones with them? Will they have, you know, and like, yes, there's a phone. You can call the center. It's like, no, what about when they're on their hikes? And it's like, well, they'll be taking two hikes. Does my child have to take both hikes? You know, it was really, it was on and on. And the poor vice principal finally just like to deflect all the nervousness said, hey, listen, something really great happens. On the night that they spend there, before they go to bed, we have a bonfire. Bonfire! Bon, are you crazy? He's like, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Stop. I know what you're thinking. You know, Girl Scouts. No, it's, um, the, the deal is, uh, the, the fire's there, but um, the children seat 25 feet back, and, and there's a row of benches between them and the fire. And it's like, like, benches don't catch on fire, you know? But I mean, it's like, great, they're going to have the bonfire, and they're going to be, like, shivering back here with their freezing cold candy bars never melting because we're too afraid to let them experience any life because, God forbid, what if I don't want to be sued? I better just take it out before it ever happens. And that's how we're constricting their lives. So the litigiousness of society seems like it might be outside of our child-rearing practices, but it actually has a very direct impact. The third reason that I think that we're so different is that there's now this expertise culture. And I think you're keenly aware of it, that um, from the second you find out that you are pregnant, um, congratulations, you're going to have a liability. <laughs> Mazel tov. Uh, you, you start feeling like there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And, uh, you know, the the, the people I blame the most are from New York City. The people who wrote um, what to expect when you're expecting. You know, is that a big thing? They look at, oh, people are just cringing. I love it when you cringe. Cringe away. They deserve it. Um, what to expect when you're expecting lays forth the premise. By the way, it started out as uh, the first edition was 300 pages. Second edition was 400 pages. 500 pages. This is the fourth edition. It's 600 pages. And it actually says on the cover, now with more symptoms than ever. It's like, yes. <laughs> Thank God. You know, I thought I was going along. Oh, wait, wait, my little toe hurt. Oh, my God, you know, you better have bed rest. Um, so the what to expect people tell you that um, every single thing you do, every single second, since you got the little notice back, and now, of course, it's like what to expect when you're thinking of maybe expecting someday and you're like 12. But anyways, what to expect once you know you're having a baby is that you better do everything exactly right or... It's all your fault if the kid turns out bad. And, and it actually tells you that um, you should worry about each bite you take. The, the early edition, uh, you know, to give them credit, the early edition said, put down that forkful. They actually said, put down that forkful if it wasn't like quinoa, uh, you know, mixed with spinach and made into a yogurt shake or something. But now they just gently suggest that each bite, bite, not meal, bite, uh, during the day, is an opportunity to feed that growing baby of yours healthy nutrients. Uh, duh. Um, but anyways, what can you get if you do each bite with the quinoa? Um, you can expect, quote, better birth weight, improved brain development, lower risk for certain birth defects. That kills me. Because what that is suggesting is that if you sat at home and there was that night when you could not resist one of these meringues like that you guys are obsessed with everywhere. My God, I've never seen a country so crazed about meringues. I've been taking pictures to bring home because I want to open a meringue factory before it gets to America because we had cupcakes first, but you guys have meringues. Okay, so, so if God forbid, instead of eating the spinach and, you know, yogurt shake that you were about to gulp down with such glee, you reach for meringue instead, and your baby ends up with a birth defect, it's your fault. It's your fault. I hope you don't mind. You just screwed your baby's entire life because you had to eat a meringue, you know? It's, it's really terrifying the incredibly tiny line that they make you walk. And nobody can walk that line, so you know that you're going to be blamed, and you're going to blame yourself. And that's just before the baby is born. Once the baby comes out, everything is up for grabs. There are row after row of books. There's this one book. I just hated the title. It said, it's called The Happiest Toddler on the Block. It's like, ha-ha, <laughs> you have the second happiest toddler, but I, mine's happier. Happy! He's happier, really happy. So 
Um, shaken baby syndrome. So um, the, what does it say in these books? It tells you how to have a conversation with your child. And I swear to you, there's one section that tells how, there's a whole section on how to tell your, like, how to talk, I'm going to say this cryptically because there are children here, how to talk about the tooth fairy, okay? Nothing, nothing. How to talk about the tooth fairy, um, which we all know, she comes and brings money. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's a whole other section on how to, look, you guys are drawing. Can I have one of those drawings? Perfect. This is incredible. Okay, and um, so what you have to do is you can't say, that is a beautiful drawing. I'm sorry. I didn't say it. I didn't say it because now she's going to think she's Picasso. She's going to get an inflated head. She's never going to draw again because that was her green and blue period. And she'll never, ever get back again. So forget it, you know. But I can't say, like, uh, crown, um, octopus. What is this? I can't tell what this is. Draw something. I couldn't say, I could say that because, of course, that would be cruel. And that would crush the incipient artist inside her until she was in a tiny fetal position and you were back to eating quinoa. So what you have to say is this, literally. Listen to me, Yumi. You have to say, it says, take a couple moments. <sighs> okay. I see you used green and blue. <laughs> like your green and blue dress. See, that shows that I'm respectfully relating, and I'm, I'm paying attention to her, but not too much attention, but not too little attention, just the right attention to show that I respect her and her incipient creativity, not too much, not too little. I can't say, uh, my friend put it this way, she said, they think that there's a huge difference, like if you say, good job, you know, they're going to go forth and conquer the world, good girl, and you've screwed it up, because now you've put the worth on them, and you don't have a normal relationship anymore, and they think that you're judging them on who they are as an artist, and that's all your love belongs to and cares about. And it's just so crazy. Every conversation, they, they say they're trying to help, but they make every conversation feel like it is the make or break conversation that you are having, you know, with your super duper Harvard goer or your psycho killer, depending on which words you chose. So they can just totally drive you crazy. And the one thing, I, the, the, the happiest toddler one, says when you're talking to your child and they're disappointed by something like, say, like we were eating cake back there and it wasn't so great cake, you can't just say, yeah, yeah, I know, it's bad cake. What can you say? You have to say, oh, sad, 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 sad. Sad, 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 cake stunk. You know, you have to, like, you have to get into it. You have to relate. Uh, it takes all the spontaneity out of being a parent, and it also assumes that anything that you would do naturally is wrong. So there's this fine line, and we are all always missing it, and that is the third reason that we feel so scared of what we're doing as parents. But my fourth reason is the favorite. It's what I call... Uh, the baby safety industrial complex, and I brought you a couple of examples. Actually, I'm going to use this, I, I want to use this thing on you that I've never used on anyone else. First, I just want to read you this one section from my favorite whipping boy. You, you must have magazines like this. I know I'll never get a freelance job from them again. Um, Parents <laughs> Magazine, <laughs> Do you have, like, you have magazines like this, right? This is what to bring to, to baby-proof your vacation, because nothing says vacation like terror and fear. Um, <laughs> Visiting family or friends this summer? Their home may not be a safe place for little ones. Ask about potential hazards. Oh, yeah, we have the alligator. Uh, you know. <laughs> and what special equipment they have so you'll know what to bring. Suggest, oh, guess what? A guy who does safety proofing for a business. Um, you'll want to know where your baby or toddler will sleep. An adult bed or the floor is not safe. Uh, an adult bed or the floor is not safe because you could fall off the bed and and what happens on the floor <laughs> nothing happened they're on the floor that's a good place for them to be put a couple pillows around them it's so obvious that the floor is safe they're here they are blatantly saying the floor is not safe so you'll need to bring a portable crib and your baby monitor because i'm sure you're going to be light years away from your baby in somebody else's house um and adult bed of the floor is not safe okay uh, if there are stairs what should you bring 
Yes, right. Bring along stair gates. That's, that's not hard to carry when you're carrying the baby and the, uh, the crib. Just bring an extra set of stair gates. Okay, other items to consider. Covers for faucets and door handles. Plastic zip ties to secure cabinets. An inflatable tub for bath time because nobody's ever had a sink in their house, right? You couldn't use a sink by that age or a bathtub even. You, know, you wouldn't want to use a bathtub. Um, an inflatable tub for bath time and a nightlight. And this is what kills me. It says, if you don't want to lug too many gadgets around, I was like, just skip it? No. Uh, rent short-term equipment. <laughs> rent it. Can you believe it? This is, this is one of the things that just is insane. This whole magazine is filled with stuff that you don't need that you would never have thought of that they're selling you, right? I mean, they have to make you worried about the floor, which is really hard to do, but they've, they've done it for some people, right? Before you're going to go out and buy a special inflatable crib or whatever or rent one when you're there. Okay, so now, back to my regularly scheduled scorn. Um, <laughs> anyone know what these are? What are these? Uh, those of you saying baby knee pads, have you read my book or do you have baby knee pads? <laughs> you just guessed it? You guessed it? Everybody else says tennis bands, wristbands. <laughs> You guys are advanced. Um, yes, these are baby knee pads because, you know, when you were deciding how to decorate the nursery, you chose crushed glass. You know, <laughs> bad idea. Otherwise, you know, why has crawling become so dangerous? These, these are, these, I love this, this is an earth-friendly item. Earth-friendly, except that it exists and you don't need it at all. Um, other than that, it's really earth-friendly. These are called table toppers. And table toppers are portable. Oh, my God, they're starting to rip. This is my favorite product. Um, these are portable placemats. Like, I, mean, I guess most placemats are portable. But anyways, they're little, um, they're disposable placemats, let's say. Um, and they provide, here's what it says. <sighs> On-the-go protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals on restaurant and food court tables. Oh, you got it. Yeah, the funny thing is, they provide protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals. So... <laughs> Your baby is in danger if you go to the food court and there are the meringues, you know, still piled high with the cappuccino you guys are constantly guzzling here, you know, slathered on top and, and the maggots from CSI, you know, are, are festering there. Or God forbid somebody wiped the table clean, your baby is in danger from the cleaning chemicals. So what this is trying to tell you is that your baby is in danger every single second you go out to eat, you leave your house. Once again, they're trying to bring wash you into thinking your child, unlike any of the 300 million years of human evolution till now, can't sit at a table and eat something without dying of horrible germs or cleaning chemicals. But, but this is my very favorite. This is my, my whipping boy. It is the baby bathwater temperature duck. <laughs> now, this duck is really good because if you have a baby and you want to put them in the tub, you put this little duck in the water, and then you wait a couple minutes, and then you turn it over, and if the word hot <laughs> appears on the duck, then you know that that water is that, that temperature that's like bad for babies, that you shouldn't stick your baby in, um, because you couldn't possibly stick your own hand in the water, and if you swish it around a little and you pull it out again, and there's only bones <laughs> left, and like there's stuff in the water and it smells like chicken soup, you know, maybe it's hot, but this guy tells you if it's hot. So, so let's just read the directions. Hmm, how do we use this? Oh, you stick it in the water, wash it in warm water, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, oh, caution. Hmm, I'll read the caution. Caution. Adult should always place hand in bath water to test the temperature before placing baby in tub. <laughs> so this duck is trying to convince you that you are too stupid, even though it knows better than you that you aren't. It knows that you can do the job and that this is completely superfluous. But when you walk around Babies Are Us, a store that did not exist when baby was me, there are, there are 10,000 items in there trying to convince you that your baby is 
physically in danger, that your baby is dramatically in danger, and that you are too stupid or too cheap to keep your child from getting scalded to death between today and tomorrow, and you'd better run out and buy something or take some class or do something dramatic or just give somebody some of your money and buy that inflatable baby tub, or you are being a terrible parent. So you take this all together, and that is why we parents are being driven crazy. But in reality, when I do all these radio interviews particularly, the, the topic that comes up most often is predators. Okay? And I just want to address that for a second because the fear of predators is really changing us dramatically too. Um, do you guys know who Dear Abby is? You know, Dear Abby, she's the advice giver, terrible, terrible advice giver. Here's some of her terrible advice. Um, what she suggested over the summer is that every morning when your child is going off to school, you just whip out your cell phone and you take a picture of your kid. Why? Why? Yes. I see this hand. Oh, yes. Exactly why. She wants you to have the picture to give to the police when your child is snatched and you never see him again. Besides that, we have a Kip safe picture of, you know, this was my child at seven. Um, it's, her idea is that the world is so dangerous that every single day when your child is leaving the house, there's a good chance, a good enough chance that you should be prepared that they will not come home. When we think that way, we start thinking about everything in terms of pedophiles and predators. And what I heard um, just recently was this lady wrote to me, and, and I put it on my website, and I asked, is this happening all over? And it was. I don't know if it's happening here yet. She said that when she takes her kid to a very small preschool in her church in a small town, um, they have decided to spend all their money this year, any money that they make through the PTA, in coming up with one of those systems where you press the PIN number before you can get in the door to bring your kids in. So first of all, they're not spending their money on toys. They're not spending money on, you know, giving to the daycare center down the street that has no money. They're spending it on this item. And she said, it just doesn't seem necessary. There's always two adults in the class. We all know each other. It's a small town. It's a small class. Why are we doing it? And then I got this flood of letters from people saying that that was happening at their daycare centers, too, and their preschools. And then people wrote to me that, like, when they go to their preschool, if they, if they, not, you know, they, they punch in their numbers and they open the door and in they go, and I'm standing behind there, say, with two babies, you know, the twins squirming around, I, you, you in front of me have to say, sorry, Ugh. and slam the door in the other person's face because that's the way the security system works. Everybody has to punch in their number. And when we think that way, when we're being prepared and we're thinking ahead and we're thinking the worst first and we think we're being smart and savvy and good parents um, and safe, what we're really doing is destroying the thing that keeps kids safe and happy and healthy, and it's called community. If you're slamming the door in my face, even though you've seen me come to that daycare center for the last six months, and you know my kids, and my kids want to say hi to your kids, but no, the security system says this will be compromised, it's the opposite of the way we want to be. And what happens when we live in a world that is like that, where we have come to trust no one outside our front door? Well, here's a letter I got um, over Christmas. Uh, it says, Dear Free Range Kids, I'm 15 right now and get pretty much no freedom. I'm limited to what's inside the house and the backyard. I can't even go as far as the sidewalk. I might be abducted or killed. I used to walk to the bus stop, but my dad said it was too dangerous, so he started driving me to the stop, and eventually he just started driving me to school. Today, after playing video games for two hours or so, I went downstairs and realized the only things I could do were eat and watch TV. Watching TV, playing video games, and eating junk food are fun and all, but even after even just a few days, it gets old. I don't want my kids, if I ever even have kids, to live like me at all. I feel bad for that kid, but I also feel amazed that it's completely ironic because obviously the parents are afraid of the child getting kidnapped, and what have they done? They have kidnapped their child, right? He's safe from everybody else, but they have kidnapped him. So what can we do? to start breaking through all this fear and all this unnecessary hovering and worrying and terrorizing ourselves and our children and start giving them back 
the quote unquote dangerous idea I have, which is an old fashioned childhood, a childhood like most of us had, where you walked to school, where you went and made your own play date, where you knocked on your friend's door, and if they weren't there, you knocked on somebody else's door. Well, a sixth grade teacher in New York wrote to me and said, I'm going to have my kids do a free range kids project. And what her proposal for them was that all they had to do was choose something that they felt like doing that they hadn't done yet that seemed a little grown up, something that they thought they were ready for, but they hadn't done yet. And this was just to goose them along a little bit. The kids were 11. And so then I came in, she had me come in, and I, I looked at all their projects, and some were completely pathetic. And I can say that because I'm um, a hemisphere away, and they will never hear. They were terrible. Um, some kids, like just the three children, um, fried an egg, 11-year-old. They fried an egg. And one kid wrote, I was terrified I was going to burn down the house. Uh, amazingly, she didn't. Um, then other kids, like, would, you know, they walked around the corner. Um, they did, you know, one kid bought a magazine. Um, but then one kid came up with an idea, and she told her mom, she said, for my project, mom, I'm going to, she lived in one of these huge apartment buildings in Manhattan, I'm going to knock on the doors of all the other um, apartments on our floor and meet the neighbors. And the mother said, what? You're going to do what kind of crazy thing? And she said, well, I just want to see who's there, and they could get to know me. And she's like, no, you're not. And she said, mom, very clever kid. This was a, a school for very, very gifted children. She said, mom, what if there's a fire? don't you want them to know that I'm in here? And the mother's like, oh, God! <laughs> Damn it! You know, fire, predator, fire, predator, extra credit. <laughs> My daughter's in magnet school, you know. Uh, finally, she said, okay. So the kid knocked on the doors, and because she's at the magnet school, she hadn't realized there were two other girls on her floor her own age. So she met her neighbors. She started doing exactly what I'm talking about, creating community. But my favorite project was this girl who decided to bake an independence cake. And she wrote this big poster. How do you bake an independence? You know, they, they can never fit it all on. How do you bake an independence cake? <laughs> <laughs> and um, how do you bake an independence cake? Well, what she decided to do was that she was going to go to the grocery store by herself, without her mom, without anybody, for the very first time. Uh, about a half a mile from her house, and she was going to use her own money, buy the ingredients, come home, and bake a cake. So um, she said, she started out on her trip, and she wrote on her, on her giant poster, she said, um, on the way there, everyone looked angry, like they were going to reach out and snatch me. Believe me, getting there was no picnic. But she got there, okay, you know, despite the, you know, sort of Wizard of Oz type <laughs> journey down the path. And, um, and then once you get to a grocery and it's your first time, it takes forever, right? You've got to find where's the eggs and the butter and the, you know, the different um, ingredients, the flour. And finally, she, she got it all together and she's standing in line. The lady behind her taps her and says, excuse me, would you watch my baby? No. <laughs> wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong story. Not, it doesn't all fit together quite that neatly. No. So finally, she gets to the line and she pays with her own money and she's leaving the grocery store and she said uh, the way home seemed much shorter and more pleasant because I was already used to the walk and that is my entire point here tonight we can give our kids the baby knee pads the baby temperature duck the Mandarin lessons the tutor the the SAT preparation for college help with the essays get them to college and move into the dorm next to them but what we really need to give them what changes the world for our children and makes them part of it is a chance to get out there and do something on their own. The world changed from a snatching, kidnapper-filled, angry world on her way there, the world that she'd been told it was, to on her way home, the world as it really is, people smiling, people beaming, herself feeling happy and at ease and at home. And that's why I'm asking you tonight to consider this very dangerous idea. Try to consider raising a free-range kid. Thank you very much.